got a special guest in the audience tonight. The producer of the film, Robert Salin, is here. Uh, maybe he could stand up and wave. There he is. Uh, he helped get this movie made, so we're really happy to have him. And he's going to stick around after the film, so if you guys have any questions about the production, I'm sure he'd be more than happy to answer a few questions, so look out for him afterwards. Um, and now I would like to welcome our uh, very special guest to the screen, but I want to make sure you guys are ready. So I feel like you guys all need to say Khan as loud as you can, and if it's loud enough, we'll have him out here. So, one, two, three. Okay, I think you're ready. Um, please help me welcome Mr. Leonard Nimoy to the stage. Thank you. Um, so. That, that's funny, that's funny. I try. I think there are two things that people remember about this film. One is, is the con moment, and the other is Ricardo Montalban's chess. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty epic. <laughs> um, so why don't we talk a little bit about kind of where you were when you came into Wrath of Khan after doing Star Trek the motion picture and the series and, you know, how, how you felt about being involved in this film. The fact is... Um, the first I heard of it was at a, at a gathering at my home, a gathering of some friends, and a producer friend named Harv Bennett was at my home, and, uh, and I knew that he was dealing with the studio about the possibility of making this film, and he said to me, how would you like to have a great death scene? And I, s I thought for a moment, I said, well, let's explore that. Now, you gotta have to understand, um, I had worked with him a number of times, and um, the first movie, the Star Trek The Motion Picture, cost something like $45 million, way over budget, and this one, when they began to talk about doing it, was going to cost a fraction of that. The first movie, in my opinion, was not really a very good Star Trek film. It was not about us, it was not about the traditional kind of Star Trek storytelling, it was an entirely different kind of movie. Now, my, my concern was that Paramount now wanted to squeeze one more bite out of the apple by making a cheap sort of television version of a Star Trek movie, and I thought this was gonna be the end of it. And I thought if that's the case, maybe it makes sense for me and the Spock character to go out in a blaze of glory and be done with it. I wasn't looking forward to finishing, but I really thought that Star Trek was finishing. And um, I said, let's, let's talk about it, let's explore this. I went to work for him, for Harv Bennett, in a project in Israel. It was called A Woman Called Golda. It was about Golda Meir, the prime minister, a woman who became prime minister of Israel. And I was playing her husband. And uh, they sent me the script while I was in Israel. And I read it and I was not terribly impressed. I didn't feel very good about it. And I contacted him, Harv, and I told him so. And um, he was producing that film that I was doing in working on in Israel. He said, you have a week off, C will you come to LA and let's deal with this? And I said, I would. I came to Los Angeles and he by then had hired Nicholas Meyer, who was a very talented, writer and a good director, and I had a meeting with the two of them. I told them what my concerns were about the script, and I got a very refreshing response, typically, particularly in television. You go to the producer and say, I have a problem with the script. They say, well, let's sit down and see what the problem is. Page 17, what's your problem there? Page 22, we'll change that line, change this moment. And what you end up with is a script with a lot of Band-Aids on it. When I told Harv and Nick what my concerns were, Nicholas Meyer, to my delight, said, I agree with you. I'm doing a rewrite. How long are you in town? When do you have to go back to Israel? And I said, Friday. He said, I'll have a script ready for you to take back on the plane. And he did, and it was wonderful. So <laughs> I thought, okay, we're going to make a movie. And um, we went to work on it, and now I'm going to uh, come to the end of this uh, 
the story about a very important question. Uh, working on the film, I felt very strongly that the film w was a good Star Trek movie, if not a terrific Star Trek movie. And we came to the day when we are going to film the death scene that Harv Bennett had talked about. And it was a very powerfully written scene, and it was playing very well, and I thought to myself, I think I have made a terrible mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and um, thankfully, Harv came down to the set as I was about to go into the chamber. So was, uh, um, this would be a spoiler for some of you who haven't seen the film, but you're going to <laughs> you're gonna have to live with this. Uh, he said, is there something you can do that can give us a thread to continue this story? And I came up with the one word, which you'll see in the movie, and those of you who've seen it know what the word is. You'll remember, won't you? <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I did that. I, I did the word. I did the, what, the piece of business that was called for. And, uh, and the movie was a, b was a very good movie and very successfully put Star Trek back on track. And we're all very grateful for that uh, because it gave me the opportunity to direct the next two films and to produce Star Trek VI. And, and uh, you know, a lot of great things happened as a result. That film really, in my opinion, saved the Star Trek franchise because it was really in trouble at that, at that moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, something that I found interesting watching the film kind of now and revisiting it is that it's Kirstie Alley's first role and then you kind of play her mentor in the film yeah. did you kind of mentor her on set was that kind did you you know in, in I guess prepping for the role did you guys strike up a you know a friendly relationship she, uh, you know it was remarkable she was she d she described herself as fresh off the turnip truck <laughs> she had just arrived in town a short time before she was auditioned for this film they gave her the role and she was terrific. She just found a, a, a center for that character, and she was so successful in it. She didn't need any mentoring from me, no. She was, she was very, very good very quickly. She understood what she had to do. Um, you know, you were cast as Spock in the original Star Trek pilot that then kind of got scrapped, and Gene Roddenberry then kind of reconstructed the show out of there, and you're the only one that kind of survived that. Um, how did the Spock character change, and do you have any kind of insight <coughs> as to why Gene Roddenberry kept you versus any of the other characters? Um, I wish he was here and he could explain that to you. I don't yeah. know. I, I don't know why. We never talked about yeah. the why of it. I was just happy to be brought back. And as a matter of fact, in the original pilot, NBC, which was the network that was going to air the show, didn't want me on the screen at all. Uh, they they really took the position that this character with the pointed ears looked devilish. <laughs> no, it's seriously. Yeah. They, they wanted they wanted me out of the show. They said in what they called the Bible Belt, all the southern states, that uh, religious people would not want this character on their TV sets because he looked devilish, and they were concerned there was going to be a negative for the show, and they wanted me out. And Gene insisted that I be in the show. And then, just before the thing aired, I, uh, uh, I got the, um, the copies of the, uh, the advertising material that they were sending out. And it, it, was, it was a brochure that, that told what the series was about. It talked about the actors in the show and talked about the various characters. And there were some photographs. And something struck me wrong about the photograph that I was in. And I realized that I didn't have the pointed ears in the photograph. And somebody at NBC had actually ordered that the ears be retouched to eliminate the pointed ears. And then shortly after the sh show went on the air and the Spock character was successful, then of course Gene got a phone call from the NBC people who in their wisdom decided that Spock was doing pretty good, we should have more of him, you know. Yeah. So it was, that's the way that story went. Yeah. Um, when was the last time you've actually seen the film? How long has it been? It's, you know, 30 years this year. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean it's probably been maybe five or six years yeah. since I've seen it. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, I'll do one more so we can wrap up and maybe start the show for these guys. Okay. Um, but 
You know, so you appeared in the new Star Trek film, the J.J. Abrams film from 2009. Last year, yeah. How was it kind of stepping back into the role? Because you had not really done anything as Spock in almost like 18 uh, years. Yeah, well, it was great because when I come on the stage, everybody bows. <laughs> it was just, it was great. It was great. <laughs> J.J. says wonderful things like, here comes the man who's responsible for us being here with these jobs. You know, <laughs> everybody bows. <laughs> No, it was great. I admire him a lot. I think he's a wonderful storyteller in film. I admire his writers. And uh, I'm thrilled with what has happened with the, with the Star Trek franchise. He's elevated the whole thing to a whole new level. Uh, I've had dinner with Zachary Quinto about three weeks ago, who had just finished working on the new one now, that's in post-production now. And he tells me that it's extraordinary that Going to work every day was exciting and fun, and everybody had a great time. So I'm expecting another great Star Trek film uh, next year. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I think I think we all are. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's give Mr. Nimoy a round of applause and thank him for coming. Thank out you. Tonight. Live long and prosper. Mm -hmm.